Okay. Uh, my name is Dariusz Stola. I have the pleasure and honor to, to chair this session and the highlight of, uh, of, of, this, of this day of the conference. And uh, my pleasure comes from the fact that the person who is about to, to speak to you in a, in, in a few seconds is Professor Elazar Barkan, who uh, is a, a prominent expert in several fields. Uh, for this conference, he has written extensively of topics uh, of human rights, memory, reconciliation. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, I suppose that those of you who are in the memory industry, excuse me for this ironic comments, because I'm a simple historian. I do some work on memory, but basically I, I have a very traditional approach which assumes that the past did happen. Uh, he wrote influential books, and especially The Guilt of Nation on Restitution and Negotiations of Historical un Injustices, and Taking Wrong Seriously on Apologies and Reconciliation. So uh, these are the, the core topics of this conference, as well of, as the series of conference genealogies of, of memory. Uh, as a historian, I have been fascinated with another book which he published, No Return, No, no, no Refuge, which is known forced migrants, refugees, and the capacity or desirability of the actual return to the, to the homeland, to the actual homeland. Uh, professor Barkan um, is, uh, is a professor of international and public affairs and director of the human rights concentration at Columbia, at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. He has published extensively on such broad topics as the human rights and the role of history in contemporary society and responses to gross historical crimes and injustices. And I, as I'm looking back into our last year conference and the previous year conference, that this topic covers something like 80% of the papers that, that were presented here. So that may be a, 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 a kind of a delayed comment to what we have uh, to what participants um, have said in this room in the past two years. Uh, but also, he does uh, a kind of a practical human rights work uh, which seeks to achieve uh, uh, conflict resolution and reconciliation by bringing people together to have a shared story of the past. And this is what I like the most, because historian's job is to tell the stories, and many people believe that this is irrelevant, that this is just an expensive hobby. Uh, but uh, uh, I do believe that when we invent a good narrative, a narrative that several people of opposing opinions can share, it's a great step forward. Or that without such a narrative, an understanding or reconciliation is almost impossible. So I will not extend this introduction anymore, uh, especially as I see that uh, people have uh, completed the coffees. And uh, I will now give floor to Professor Barkan, who will speak about justifying atrocities, contested victims. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very honored and glad to have the opportunity to be here. Um, I first of all would like to draw your attention to the image behind me, uh, which is what we have in Col at Colombia, we are coordinating a network which is different but with similar themes to the network here. So I thought that might be of interest to people. We are having a large conference, international conference, next week. Um, and it is a network of historical dialogue and accountability. So if you're interested in uh, more information, you can get it from there or I'm happy to speak about it. What I'd like to do today is to talk about a topic that is well known by all of you, victims, but I hope to point to some aspects that are less frequently discussed and perhaps to make some things that are familiar a little stranger. So let me start in Yasukini in Japan. South Korea President Park declared recently that she saw no point in a summit with Japan unless the country apologized for war crime wrongdoings. Notwithstanding intensified concerns over regional security, in particular, following North Korea's third nuclear test, historical memory is at the heart of Northeast Asia regional politics. Korea and China regularly demand apologies from Japan for several issues, including the slave sex uh, known as the comfort women. <clears throat> 
This week, the tension is particularly heightened. One rich annual ritual which never fails to raise protest is the commemoration of Japanese war dead at the Yasukini Shrine in Tokyo. The shrine honors two and a half million Japanese war dead, included, including 14 convicted Class A war criminals from World War II. The shrine also honors many others who have committed war crimes but have never been convicted. Japanese politics, politicians, especially sitting prime ministers, make a ritual of visiting the shrine in the fall or pl planning to visit it, which creates an ongoing crisis in the region. This past October, Prime Minister Abe did not visit but sent his offering, which in itself instigated only moderate protests. The shrine glorifies the memory of the dead and presents a nationalist history of Japanese colonialism. Particularly jarring for Japan's victims is the fact that the war criminals who were executed by the Allies are commemorated as victims of unjust trials. Japan remembers the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and sees itself as a victim of the war. It tends to forget the colonialisms and massacres, the mass displacement and biological warfare, the medical experiments, the slave labor. As part of Japan's self-perception as a victim, its war criminals are also viewed as victims, not as perpetrators. I should hasten to add that like most countries, when I say Japan, Japan is a complex society. There are diverging views among Japanese, and there is a meaningful minority of those who criticize Japan's role in war, denounce the atrocities, and are peace activists. Yet overall, Japan continues to see itself as a victim. And despite issuing numerous convoluted apologies, it has never owned its crimes or disavowed its war criminals. So let me move to another part of the world and talk about the double genocide, not the kind that you are thinking of immediately when I mention it. The memory and commemoration of the genocide in Rwanda is profoundly controversial. The horrific killing by Hutu of Tutsi and others during the 100 days in 94 has become the symbol of the most horrific genocide. How many were killed? Conventionally, the number recited is 800,000, but this may be general estimate rather than a good approximation. The genocidaires were named extreme Hutu, but so many committed crimes that the term extreme may refer to the majority. Yet many Hutu moderates, so to speak, were also killed. Some were killed while protecting Tutsis, others by the advancing Tutsi, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, the RPF, which eventually defeated the Rwanda army and brought the killing of the Tutsis to an end. The war continued in the Congo, where an untold number of killings and atrocities were committed, many by the escaping genocidaires, but also by the Tutsi-led Rwanda army and various sponsored militia. The atrocities in the Congo continued for years, both related to and independent of the Rwandan genocide. There were many victims who were not recognized as such, and many perpetrators who have been treated as victims by the international organizations and humanitarian NGOs. The lines of demarcations have never been clear. Following the genocide, Paul Kagame became the leader of Rwanda, even before he became elect elected as president, and under him, the political ideology in Rwanda has been to repress ethnic divisions. There is only one official narrative of the genocide, and the state increasingly controls political and historical discourse. For years after the genocide, the widespread and official reference was to the genocide of the Tutsis and the Hutu moderates. Over recent years, it has become instead the Tutsi genocide. The constitution was amended to read Tutsi, Tutsi genocide, and while the UN continues to commemorate the Rwandan genocide, these have become code words. In Rwanda, the term Rwandan genocide is viewed as supporting the Hutu. This is a, there is a critical st a struggle. Who is the victim? Who is the perpetrator? There is no denial of the genocide against the Tutsis. The debate is about who else is legitimate victim, and by implication, who are the perpetrators who committed the crimes against the other victims? For example, should the national commemoration be on April 6 or on April 7? April 6 is the day marked by the shooting down of the then Rwandan president, Habi Aramana. 
who was a Hutu and the Burundi, Burundian president. Was that the beginning of the genocide or the mass killing that followed? The Hutu diaspora pushes for no April 6. The formal day in Rwanda is the 7th. The competition is who, who, is, the, uh, who is considered a victim, where Hutu also victims. One example of the politics of victimhood is the recent imprisonment of the Hutu opposition presidential candidate, Victor Inbere, who was in denied the ability to run in the 2010 election, in part because she demanded the Hutu memorial. Tutsis argued that this meant she was supporting the double genocide thesis. There is a war of memories. Some Hutus argue that they are victims of the genocide as well. In contrast, the official position is that the Hutus and other non-Tutsis victims were not targeted as an ethnic group, but were merely trapped between cross-fighting. Therefore, they do not deserve to be included in official commemoration services. The official position on the quilling of the Hutu and other non-Tutsi victims is that it was not a result of genocide and no crimes were committed by the Tutsis. But the Tutsis. This is the result of Rwanda's rigid limitation of freedom of speech, the guilt that the West feels because of its failure to stop the genocide, and the well-functioning society that Kagame continues to rule with an iron fist. In combination, these factors mean that there is no pressure on him from the international community, and the only voices of opposition come from the Hutu diaspora. Victimhood is at the heart of Rwanda politics. But the relative safety and prosperity of the country may, not, may be of limited duration. Before 1990, the Tutsi were in an analogous position to the Hutu after the genocide. That is, their own victimhood had been ignored and they were viewed as perpetrators. In 1990, following the Tutsi invasion of Rwanda from Uganda, the conflict deteriorated and the violence and fear generated by historical victimizations became fertile ground for what exploited by the Hutu power to perpetrate the genocide. The cycle of violence and continued pattern of government refusal to recognize the victimhood of others creates a potentially explosive situation. It underscores the risk that these contentious narratives carry for the future of the country. So these are two prominent cases where contested memories and commemorations of victimhood shape international and national conflicts. The expansive notion of victimization means that ever-growing number of groups and individuals are viewed as and consider themselves victim. The statement we are all victims now is both affirmation of victims and the critique of the phenomena. The ever-widening circles of victimhood face no recognized boundaries or ethical limitation. It is hard to determine who is not a victim. This is true both at the individual and at the group level. The question of victimhood is interesting because claims that in one context are ethical and affirming become offensive and instigate conflict in other contexts. Consider the conflict resolution and prevention professionals who reject engagement with the past because they believe that since the past cannot be changed, people should just get over it. They do so from what in the political science is called the realist perspective. Yet their argument is naive, because when measured against the numerous conflicts around the world that have been instigated because of memories and fear of past violence. Even worse, it is viewed by, as offensive by the victimized communities that refuse to forget their own condition and who view attempts to overlook the past as double victimization. From this perspective, denial of suffering is both unethical and politically unproductive. On the other hand, the proliferation and legitimations of claims to victimhood has the consequences of transforming individual and a group identity the status of the victim becomes the core of the identity. And of course, some claim to victimhood, like those in the names of the Japanese perpetrators, are inherently offensive. So how should we assess conflicting memories? How should we weigh their relative validity? Since it is clear that there cannot be a ranking of legitimacy among victims, how should victimhood be integrated into politics? Does guilt shape victimization? 
Does being guilty of or implicated in violence impact the perspective of the intensity of the victimhood? In other words, does or should victimhood be viewed as context dependent? Validating victims is widely seen as moral and just. Indeed, there is a growing recognition that victims' right to truth is a fundamental human right. And maybe we can get that to that later. I actually didn't have time to speak about the right to truth. But there is too little discussion about the cost and open-ended valorizations of subjective descriptions of victimizations. <clears throat> More than a decade ago, Ian Buruma described the Olympics of suffering as a curious source of pride. He viewed with alarm, the ex I quote, the extents to which so many minorities uh, have become to define themselves above all as historical victims. He was referring to groups including Hindu nationalists, Armenians, African Americans, American Indians, and Japanese Americans. At the same time, at about the same time in the Guilt of Nations, I argued that admitting guilt by perpetrators was a source of new morality in international politics and, explore, and I explored the questions of how this new morality was related to the category of undeserving victims. By undeserving victim, I meant victims who in some manner were members of a group that instigated the conflict and were thus directly or indirectly implicated in their own eventual suffering and becoming victims and therefore may not be the first in line for redress. They are still nonetheless victims. Especially, I'm sorry, specifically I refer to the status and the politics that informed the German expellees organizations. The questions of German as victims in World War II goes to the heart of this debate, but is also special in that not only did Germany perpetrated the crimes and atrocities and instigated the war which carried in its wake also retaliation, but Germany also has been the most repentant nation. Asserting victimhood also means accusing perpetrators. Drawing attention to German victims concurrently accuses the perceived perpetrators, the Allies. And people from the Allied nations are not necessarily eager to share the view out of context that accusing them of perpetrating atrocities and they are unwilling to equate the suffering and criminality of both sides. Since 2000, there has been an exp exponential explosion in the fields of historical justice and memory and allied fields that address victimhood, in particular, past victimizations and memory. Yet, little attention has been paid to the category of the victim in history. There has been backlash by conservatives in the US against victimhood, and as a moral dilemma, the violence of victimhood has been explored more recently. But few have studied victimhood as a form of political agency in a comparative perspective and its impact on contemporary policies and instigating conflicts. This is a puzzle. After all, victims are all around us and conflicts instigated as a result of historical victimizations are numerous. At times, it seems everyone is a victim. Suffering endows victim with a moral high ground they have become the emblem of morality and enjoy moral legitimacy and political capital. My point is that compassion for victimhood is not cost-free. And the question I'm interested in this talk is how should we respect victimhood without sowing the seeds for further conflict? How should we acknowledge victims without justifying or overlooking and ignoring crimes committed by those who later, later become victims or by victims who later become perpetrators? This question may be irresolvable, and the moral dilemmas are great, but the fields of memory and transitional justice, as well as conflict resolution, need to grapple with this. The challenge is to formulate empathetic political framework that can engage victimhood without abdicating analysis in the face of horrific suffering. Historically, victims were those who were offered as a sacrifice to some deity or supernatural power. Indeed, the willingness to be sacrificed for the greater good endows victim with eternal morality. Most famously, Jesus is viewed as a victim. The category extended to those who were killed or were subjected 
to cruel or oppressive treatment and expanded to people who suffered some injury or loss or even taken advantage of. The moral superiority of the victim as a category is inherent in the language and in the culture. Contemporary attention to victim would emerge first during and as a result of World War I, when the first international efforts to aid, aid refugees as victims emerged, and when the mass phenomena of shell shock soldiers who were psychologically victimized were also first recognized. This notion of victimhood expanded dramatically after World War II when the Holocaust came to represent the ultimate victimization. In the 60s, public discourse incorporated the notions of victims of everyday crimes and the concept of victim move evolved even quicker around the world. Vic victims have become the subject of study as a separate category from the criminal. The field of victimology aims to put the victim at the center of the study and to explore the impact that the crime has on the victim. Victimology is analogous to criminology, though less well known. It has long-standing scholarship which began in the 40s and expanded in the 1970s as part of the legal studies and sociology. It deals primarily with victims of crimes, not national or group conflict. Yet, there is chronological continuity between victimology and the growth of human rights. In particular, their concurrent emergence after World War II and their expansion since the 70s. In the United States, there is a strong victim's rights, excuse me, it's hot. There is a strong victim's rights movement which began in the 1970s when academics, right advocates, and often politicians pursued its wider recognition. Early victimologists, mirroring their own time, began by investigating the responsibility of victims and their actors as factors that led to or contributed to their own victimization. Incidentally, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary continues to define victimology as, and I quote, the study of the ways in which the behavior of crime victims may have led to or contributed to their own victimization, to their victimization. But that approach has largely disappeared. Indeed, perhaps the clearest example of changing norms away from blaming the victim is evident with regard to the violence against women. Not long ago, the norm was to blame women for inviting domestic and sexual violence. In most instances, this is no longer the case, obviously. Victim suffering was further legitimized by the emergence of human rights discourse internationally, which focused on rights and overlooked the potential complicity of the victims in their own situation. The moral paradigm of victim who underscores victim as the weaker party in a social situation that leads to injury and harm beyond the victim's control. The movement of victims' rights was institutionalized in the 80s through advocacy of the women's movement and other social mobilization and led to the formation of various organizations with both defending victims and advocating for policies. Excuse me. Let me repeat, uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and advocating for policies to fight crime from drunk driving to child abuse to violence against women. Both victimology, which addresses individual crimes and advocacy of behalf and members of groups that are victimized mutually reinforce the moral superiority of the victims. By the 1980s, the questions of victimization became part of international relations and the UN took on the questions of victims of crime and abuse of power. Victims were defined as, quote, persons who individually or collectively have suffered harm. Thus, the UN formally connected victims of all violence. The def definition of the victim was open-ended, including those who suffer from legal acts, and now I quote, that do not yet constitute violations of national criminal laws but of internationally recognized norms relating to human rights. So the, the category is very expansive. To a much lesser extent, but nonetheless recognized, is the phenomena of contested victims. That is, the status of victims who are implicated in perpetrating violence, whether in conflict or domestic criminals. <clears throat> 
Increasingly, however, public discourse hi highlights the lack of agency by perpetrators who become victims, castigating them as candidates for mercy, if not wholly moral exemplars. This creates the moral political predicament. Diane Enns poses the challenge strikingly in the book, The Violence of Victimhood, and I quote, once we see the soft, frail underbelly of the perpetrators, killers, genocidaires, racists, misogynists, rapists, warmongers, and even the lonely young vampire, how do we demand their accountability?" End of quote. This moral ambivalence frames a critical examination of the perpetrator as a victim. We recognize concurrently the violence of victims and maintain the concept of the victim as a paragon of morality. This amplifies the need to engage in political, psychological, and social analysis of victimhood while recognizing their desire and demand to be acknowledged as victims. Activists and organizations that work on questions of memory and commemoration, as well as human rights and transitional justice, advocate for greater recognition of the number and types of victims. In contrast, sectarian conservative position, whether scholarly or in the policy and or advocacy field, challenges the notions of expansive victimhood from the liberal and pathetic perspective. These challenges generally do not contest the notions of victimhood. Rather, the conservative position recognizes only our victims and denies theirs. It is not a principled challenge, but it is rather an argument about who is a legitimate victim. <coughs> Consequently, there is an unintended mutual reinforcement between sectarian nationalists on the one hand and memory and human rights activists who advocate for victims on the other. Rarely does anybody discuss the political cost of fa failing to critically evaluate the claims of victims. The intellectual and often political expansiveness of victimhood is not without cost, as I said. For example, in the United States, the victim rights movement has lobbied strongly for more stringent sentencing and has played an important role in the enormous expansion of the number of people incarcerated. Given the discrimination in the American judicial system along racial and class line, harsher sentences mean that poor people and racial minorities are frequently incarcerated longer and disproportionately as a result of victim desire for revenge. This contestation of specific victimhood is more likely to occur in conflict and post-conflict situation. And it is done largely by outsiders, by the other, as illustrated by the Japanese or the Tutsi case. It is not a concept of victimhood that is challenged, but the particular claims of a specific group. The need to contextualize victimhood is particularly acute because in many cases of group victimization, the mental of victimhood informs an anxiety, a sense of fear, which often leads to a desire for revenge. Victimhood in such instances is not a passive state of affairs in need of acknowledgement or empathy, rather it's a political agenda and a motivation for action. Armed with moral justification, victims are too often shielded from criticism and many perpetrators are looking for cover under the guise of victims, victimhood. The big moral tent of victimhood is too easily accommodating to perpetrators. The claim of victimhood provides a strong mobilizing and political force and delegitimizes critical political conversation. Although the claim of victimization informs and incites many conflicts, there is relatively little public discussion of countering victimhood motivated conflicts. So let me say a couple of words about the perpetrators, the victims. I know that everyone knows from their own work about it in their own cases. The perpetrator's claim to being a victim is as old as society itself. The first biblical reference to crime is the story of Cain, who after being rejected by God, sees himself as a victim, turns his anger towards his brother Abel, and kills him out of jealousy. A self-perceived victim turns his rage into vengeance against a third party. The story is all well known to us, but we don't know whether Abel was a passive bystander or implicated in aggravating the injury by, ta by taunting Cain. When confronted by God, Cain denied responsibility. He both denies in these, his deed 
and guilt and sees himself as the offended party. When punished, he protests, my punishment is more than I can bear. The dynamic is all too familiar to contemporary readers. The class of perpetrators as victims refer to those who had been victimized and turned perpetrators, either for lack of choice or as a matter of revenge, whether motivated by trauma, politics, or other reasons. It encompasses endless variations from criminals who, has been who have been molested as child to child soldiers. Child soldiers epitomize Child soldiers epitomizes the situations where atrocities are committed by those who have no choice, where the distinction between the perpetrator and the victim makes neither moral nor political sense. In crisis situations, moral dilemmas are just dead, irresolvable puzzles. The molested child turns rapist has more of a choice than the child soldier who has likely no choice but to kill or be killed. But in both cases, we should not let recognitions of the perpetrator's background paralyze the political and the policy discourse. The spectrum of responsibility and guilt of perpetrators is wide, as is the discourse that excuses violence by victims. One type of perpetrator's victims include those who suffer from having inflicted violence, witnessed the violence, surviving the violence, or being part of a group of people who perpetrated atrocities. The clearest example, perhaps, as a category is the adult soldier as the victim. Obviously, soldiers have always been victims in wars and often recognized for their heroic sacrifice, evoking the original meaning of the victims as a sacrifice. But after World War I, as I mentioned, the, the recognition of shell shock soldier expanded the definition of the victims to include people who were psychologically injured. This type of victimization has expanded over the last century, and today, to give just one example, there are over a quarter of a million American veterans who have suffered PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, since 2000. The vast majority of these did not perpetrate atrocities. They likely witnessed violence, were part of a machine that inflicted violence, or were engaged in humanitarian assistance. In this context, it is difficult to determine who the perpetrator is, and the moral lines are very blurred. Military, paramilita paramilitary, and refugee warriors are some of the categories of perpetrators who may or may not be simultaneously considered victims. From the Wehrmacht to the NKVD, to Latin American dictatorships to guerrilla fighters, the ranks of perpetrators are populated by forced recruiter, recruits who become evildoers, oftentimes without a choice. Consider, for example, the relatively unknown group of the village guards, a militia set up by the Turkish government in Kurdish populated areas in southeast of the country in the mid 1980s as a counterforce to the PKK, to the Kurdish national uh, group. The village guards numbered up to 100,000 and committed numerous crimes from murders and disappearance to robbery, rapes, burning villages, and were the main culprit responsible for the mass displacement in the region of which reached more than one million internally displaced persons. Yet critics recognize that the village guards were forced by the Turkish military to volunteer. If they refused, they were viewed as Kurdish nationalists were harassed and expelled, and their villages were burned. As a human rights organization reported, I quote, people were terrified that if they accept the system, they would be attacked by the PKK, and if they didn't, they would have been driven out of their homes and refused security, making it impossible to live in the village. And while there was no legal requirement to join the village guard, System, the village guard system, serving as a village guard has become a de facto requirement for return to the village from displacement. The members of the village guards were certainly perpetrators, but were they also victims? It's very hard to say. It is not being claimed, by the way, in Turkey generally, and it depends on the specifics of each case. The representations of perpetrators as victims is informed by multiple considerations. It is a result of straightforward political desire 
to evade guilt and responsibility for large-scale human rights crimes and mass violence. At times, it is part of a psychological coping strategy, an expansion of inhuman behavior under stress, and other times it's a procedure of international domestic criminal justice in order to attenuate guilt and in which the other party is blamed for giving cause to the origin of the crime. Um, it is also part of the politicized discourse of coming to terms with collective guilt borne by the group and nation as a whole. So what about conflict resolution? I think the most important reason to study victimization is because of the politics and the role of history in conflict resolution and prevention, or the lack of. From an international relation perspective, this could be considered an ignored variable. Contested victimhood and the representation of perpetrators as victims are important causes of conflict, but they receive little attention in the literature of conflict prevention. For example, many Croats and Serbs see the other side reciprocal claim for victimization as a form of aggression. They each point to a different point in history and to the chronology of events in specific conflagration to justify their own position and show how their own side was the real victim, to explain why their victimization dwarfs that of the other, and to justify the violence they, they perpetrated as a self-defense. This is often the case in a conflict, post-conflict situation, or when the claim of victimization by a group is offensive to the other side and instigate animosity. This is a core challenge because it is widely recognized that the sense of aggrieved victimhood plays a critical role in conflict instigation and in later in conflict resolution, prevention, and nation building. The study of victimhood engages several related but separated fields, including history, conflict resolution, conflict prevention, including the responsibility to protect, human rights, and transitional justice. Very often, these fields are separated from each other. Historians do not think in terms of intervening, intervening in contemporary conflict, while the conflict resolution professionals largely lack the historical in-depth knowledge and the attention to historical victimization as a cause of a conflict. Conflict resolution ignores the past and the source of victimhood, asserting instead that they can neither change the past nor resolve differences about it. Therefore, the focus of the conflict resolution professional and processes is directed to the med mediation and to the future. On the other end, transitional justice pay attention to the past, certainly to the recent past and to the survivors of violence, but transitional justice prioritize, prioritizes accountability through justice and pays attention to commemoration and acknowledgement of victims suffering. Yet it is less interested in conflict resolution and in the wider sense of accountability that involves historical dialogue. Traditional justice, as we all know, is focused on the judicial process, trials and tribunals primarily, or validating victims primarily through testimony and truth commissions. It is little to say on the relations of the identity and the self-perceptions of the group to the conflict. Consider, for example, the Armenian genocide or the role of the memory of World, to World War II in the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. Both involve contested victims, yet because they are now 60 or 100 years old, they are largely beyond the reach of judicial adjudication or the testimonies of survivors, what the retrospective justice. The methodology of discussing victimhood in these cases is primarily historical, but historical study as a mechanism in conflict resolution hardly exists. So social psychologists emphasize that a group that has been victimized in the past and has not healed is more likely to instigate mass violence. This is a result of fear, feeling threatened, and, responsibility, and responding with aggression. Validating victim, victims aggravates these negative emotions and political attitudes, and in many cases instigates conflict. National or collective trauma is widely discussed even as many questions remain about the relations of individual to group trauma. Yet there is no doubt that the group identity is often shaped by what is called collective trauma. Even individuals who have not suffered or were not in danger 
internalize the identity associated with the traumatized. The main consequences is that the group finds it hard to empathize with the needs of the others, to open up to learn about the suffering of the other side. Sometimes this is because the lack of exposure to the other and sometimes resistant to such exposure. A recent psychological study sought to examine, I quote, the consequences of remembering historical victimization for emotional reactions to current adversar adversary. And its result confirmed what we would expect. People were more likely to accept violence against the group who reminded, who, when reminded of their own group's fast, past uh, suffering. Political manipulations of victimhood is widespread. The capacity to shift national identity is quite elastic. Let, this, let me look br briefly at China, in part because of the dramatic shifts in its national attitude to national victimhood. China presents the global challenge of special magnitude in numerous fields, not least of which is the intensive and comprehensive nationalist campaign of victimhood over the last generation that increases the possibility of conflict in Northeast Asia, which I began with. Never forget national humiliation. This is a Chinese characterization of China's victimizations between 1840, the Opium War, and 1945, the liberation from Japanese occupation. The short version of this is that while the perspective of national humiliation goes back to the early 20th century, it disappeared from public discussion after World War II and did not reappear until after Tiananmen Square in 89 and after the fall of the Soviet Union in 91, when the Chinese government felt a crisis of legitimacy and decided to use patriotism as an alternative to communism. The government did not choose to promote pride in its 5,000 years of history, but rather focused on the 100 years of victimhood. A massive re-education followed, directed mostly against Japan, that dates like September 18, commemorating the Japanese invasion in 1931, or extensive education about the Nanjing massacre, commemorated and reified in a disputed number of 300,000 dead, have become prevalent in China. Opinion polls show widespread anti-Japanese feeling and a general belief in the likelihood of an undefined future war. Perhaps most pertinent to the questions of mobilizing victimhood in this case is the rapidity with which the national psyche has shifted. In barely a generation, a topic that has not existed was manipulated by the authorities and became the core of national identity. Chinese students learn everything about Japanese crimes, but nothing about the domestic violence in China, the millions of dead as a result of the Great Leap Forward, or which was up to 45 million, or the Cultural Revolution with its horrific effects of society. The atrocities by the Japanese against the Chinese are not contested in this case, although the specifics are, for example, the number who killed in Nanjing. Rather, the dispute focuses on the government's selective manipulation of memory, which is presented as a moral claim and that aggravates conflict and collides with Japan's analogous manipulation of its own national memory. The current relation between Japan and China, between Ch Japan and Korea are particularly tense, and much of this tension is not in contemporary politics, but is a result of contested victimhood. So what is to be done? The first approximation is that victimhood has to be recognized for what it is, a complex political phenomenon that both affirms victim suffering and incites victims' desire for revenge, both elicit compassions and motivate conflicts. The challenge is to channel victimization in a manner that would diminish rather than intensify its conflict and to incorporate the discourse of memory and identity constructed in scholarship, advocacy, politics, and and the law into conflict resolution. Our goal, and in this I think our, in this room particularly, should be to develop multivalent historical dialogue of partially overlapping discourses, those that include state institutions, scholars, legal professions, civil society, and many more actors. By historical dialogue, I refer to nonlinear discourse 
with contributions from opposing sides who are not necessarily actively engaging each other directly. While outsiders contribute to rewriting of history, and good empirical historical research is not dependent on the identity of the author, in the final analysis, members of the protagonist's communities have to own the historical narrative in order for it to have legitimacy with the public. Reconfiguration of the collective memory is most likely to occur when it is advocated by members of the group. Depending on how memory is handled, subject to more or less verification, the goal of participants in historical dialogue should be to shape nation public counter memory to reduce nationalists' influence. The first challenge is to produce intersubjective histories of victimization that aim to present non-partisan narratives where the disagreements are laid out professionally and do not stem from the identity of the scholars. The right to truth, seen as an inalienable right, can often be sectarian. Right advo rights advocates, especially in transitional justice, have to acknowledge that the substance of the right to truth has to be understood as mediated truth, one that includes the perspective of different sides and has the aim of contributing to conflict resolution, not to conflict. Pursuing sectarian perspective as a right way, in many cases, contribute more to conflict than to redress. Sectarian truth is not more true than mediated truth, and dialogue does not convey bartering truth for compromise. I've written elsewhere about the role of history in conflict resolution. Here I would like just to emphasize the need for victims advocates in different discourses to consider the larger consequences of sectarian victimhood memory advocacy. Healing is hard to measure, and it is impossible to establish whether specific policies contribute to healing. But the claim from victims advocates is that acknowledgement and expression of empathy, especially by the perpetrators, contributes to healing. And acknowledgements come in different forms. Legal decisions provide one form, memory and commemoration another. The acknowledgement can be performed by the insiders, by the others, or by impartial observers. While it is claimed that acknowledgement can be achieved in part by the group itself when it engages, I quote, in certain kinds of memorials and rituals of mourning and remembrance, end of quote, such commemoration may not have self-evident positive impact on the effort to transform the conflict. Indeed, one could see that commemoration by victims themselves might lead to a greater frustration when the acknowledgement is not reciprocated by the perpetrators. The animosity often increases because the lack of reciprocity is seen as denial. This is obviously most famous with the case with the Armenians. In retributive transitional justice and international criminal justice, the aim is part to punish the perpetrators in order to acknowledge victims. But justice provides at best a, pass a partial solution. In cases of mass atrocities, justice cannot provide adequate accountability and redress. Too few of the perpetrators are punished, and the sentences are viewed by the victims as too short and lenient. This does not mean that the efforts to prosecute major perpetrators are not worthy, but it is hard to imagine a prosecution that befits the crime. Commemoration, narratives, and acknowledgement may provide an alternative, a complementary mechanism, and at times more satisfactory form of accountability. In short, discussing victimizations of population, especially of crimes of atrocities, we should use simple language and avoid emotional hype or rhetorical access, emphasize context and causes of events, and reaffirm the historical context and clearly separate actions from reactions. Above all, avoid the cult of victimizations. Let me conclude by saying that actually I think that this network and this kind of conference that reaches to a memory and to acknowledgement beyond a unidirectional or a single community is the real, the only hope that we have not to turn victimization and victimhood into fetish and to, to this over the long term, over long term,
to be the uh, causes of conflict. Thank you very much.